Hi, I am Mike Smith from Poorly Summarized, and I took a left at the valley. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists. You know, we don't have non-astrologers and all that. But with religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith in unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. Well, despite a whole bunch of uh, technical difficulties and coming at you from another set of exaggeration, this is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and I played poker with tarot cards last night. I had a full house, and two people died. <laughs> Joining me, as usual, is a team that asks, Why are piano players called pianists, but a person uh, driving a race car is not called a racist? <laughs> uh, he's addicted to placebos, and he could quit, but it wouldn't matter anyway, Tyler. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> and he almost had a psychic girlfriend once, but she left him before they ever met. Kevin. That's right. <laughs> she broke up with me before we started going out. Guys, welcome back. Um, despite all our fun difficulties and technical issues, tough. we're going to have a, an interesting show today, but first let's do a bit of chit-chat. Did you guys hear about the uh, liberal MP? I think her name is, I think I've got this right, Ikra Khalid? <laughs> okay. She's uh, she's a liberal MP, and she's uh, been given uh, more police protection because she tabled a motion con- to condemn Islamophobia. This is Bill M one hundred three. Apparently, she's received death threats at this point. Yeah. So the bill calls on the government to condemn and eliminate Islamophobia and all forms of uh, systemic racism and religious discrimination. I have to agree with Richard Dawkins and Matt Dillahunty that Islamophobia is just some made-up shit. Right, exactly, right? I I, th- I feel the same way. Now, I, I hate to say this because it's rare that I'm actually in agreement with the Tories, but the, the Tories are saying, like, uh, is uh, Islamophobia is underdefined in the bill, and I think they might have a very valid point here. Well, the scary thing is that if we have these hate speech laws, like that Jordan Peters psychologist you were telling us about, with that you can be charged for using the wrong pronoun, mm-hmm. they might be able to do kind of the same thing where if you criticize Islam at all, you get charged That's with right. discrimination. It's so. such an easy thing to toss, right? Oh, you're, you're racist, you're Islamophobe. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm not concerned about Islam. I really am. I'm not concerned about Muslims, the average Muslim person. I am concerned about the doctrine of Islam. Well, I, I really yeah. am. And you can be anti Islam, like anti the religion, without being anti Muslim. Exactly. So, which exactly. Is the same thing with Christianity and just I, because you disagree with is- Islam does not mean that you should that you should be considered to be Islamophobic. It's basically well, what they're yeah, saying, right? Yeah, you just because you don't agree with Islam doesn't mean that you you are, are necessarily afraid of the average Muslim person out there. Yeah. I'm, I'm more afraid of the anti-vaxxers. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, that too. Seriously, I put my kid in danger a heck of a lot more than terrorists. I mean, the odds of you getting killed by a terrorist is so low. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. More yeah. likely to win the lottery or get hit by lightning. So it's going to be a very interesting debate they're going to have in the House of Commons or for, for something like that, So uh, in, in Parliament, I should say. And uh, I guess we'll have to keep an eye on it. No, they should consult Richard Dawkins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, this is definitely the yeah. chair recognizes Richard Dawkins. <laughs> That'd be interesting. So, you want me to talk about my news? Yes, let's talk about your news. Absolutely. Well, oh, took... hold on. We should, should we get a drum roll for this? Yeah. Or? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure. I have a drum roll. But I have an applause. So, what's your news? Uh, well, it's been a month and a half since the president of Vancouver CFI Center for Inquiry. Yes. Uh, himself nominated me to become the co-president. Cool. I'm, I'm just calling myself vice president, but the uh, the vote went through. They voted me in, so and I don't live in Vancouver. And Tyler Laguerre is now vice president of CFI, is what you say? Yeah, and I don't know any of these people. <laughs> awesome. I just know the president. He was on the show with Aaron Ra during the May the 4th episode. Yes, that was and our friend uh, Aaron Bays. Yeah, I guess he's been seeing me on Facebook and that sort of thing and thought I'd be a good contributor. So uh, the second thing would be Gordon Murray Leslie is the vice president of the BC Humanists, Mm -hmm. and he's invited me to become a board member on the board of directors for uh, the the BC Humanists. Look at you go. That's awesome. All this because of this show. 
Hope you remember that. No, it's just kidding. <laughs> and I, I don't know if you guys are aware that Enrique Rempel died the other day. I know. Yeah, that yeah. is sad news. One of our listeners, Enrique Rempel. Uh, you know, the funny thing is that I was just talking to him. On yeah, Chris Christensen's thing, was it? Yeah, no. I think he was actually well, commenting uh, on Chris. I, I, I talk to him via Facebook on a regular basis. I've been to a couple of movies with him. And the, uh, it's kind of sad. He passed away and young, too. Uh, slightly older than I. Uh, still in his 40s. Yeah. And... Uh, and uh, on top of that, his birthday was the next day. Oh! After I found yeah. out, I was saying, "Oh my God!" I still, I still sent him a happy birthday. I don't know <laughs> on Facebook. I was, I was debating that Zach and Chris Christensen's post about the resurrection, mm-hmm. and I saw Zach comment and say, "I don't know, Enrique, you, what's going on?" Because he couldn't see my comments. Yeah. Because I blocked oh. Enrique like a year or two ago. Oh, you, he, you, you and Enrique didn't get along. Yeah, he's just. He got on my nerves with all this Christian stuff, and he yeah. just kept like following me and commenting. And then I found out he was dead, and I was like, "Oh." Well, he was he wasn't an bad. atheist per se. No, he was a Christian. Well, he, yeah, he was he was still a listener of the show though. So, mm-hmm. and you know, he we had some nice back and forth with him. But you know, he did a lot for the community. Yeah, so I hear, so I hear. And now apparently, there's also a uh, a bit of a fund apparently that some of the uh, atheists. Uh, I don't know if the atheist members started that, but anyway, apparently, just to help his widow and kids. Yeah. Oh, so. probably the atheist Fraser Valley group. Yeah, I think so. I saw I saw one of our uh, uh, the members there posted something about that. So we can post that at the end of this show. Yeah. yeah. See, we we don't like Christianity, but when a Christian like that dies, we jump in to help him, right? Exactly. Absolutely. It's exactly. like brotherly love kind of thing, right? Yeah. Exactly. So you know, <laughs> I hate to use that 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 turn of phrase, but uh, Godspeed, Enrique. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so I've got some projects going on. I actually spoke to the Ministry of Education the other day. Yes. And. The guy that I spoke to is a skeptic. He, we were talking about oh, Michael smart. Shermer. The Ministry of Education has a skeptic? Yeah! Yeah, I'm not going to mention his name just in case, oh, that's I, get, fine, of course. In case I get in trouble, but uh, he's sending me the stuff f- regarding the curriculum for logical fallacies mm. and like evolution and stuff. So uh, Aaron and I are going to kind of look over it and see if there's anything we can do to kind of change it a little bit. I think you and Aaron should set up some kind of PowerPoint presentation and take that through the schools. If they'll let us actually do it. So well, I don't see what it will. He said it's pretty easy to get suggested material, but even the philosophy, you know how you said BC changed their curriculum this yes, year? Yes, yes. It's all elective, so none of this stuff is mandatory, right? Okay. So we do need a mandatory logical fallacies class. We do need some type of basic political education for grade 12, so they know the difference between Left wing, right wing, and center. You know, liberals, conservatives. Well, hold on. Are you are you, ta- are you taking like maybe that's two different subjects altogether? Now, what you're thinking here? Yeah, no. Um, Critical when, thinking when, and left wing and right wing is when, two different things. When right? talking about uh, politics and stuff, I think I have to kind of put down my CFI hat off and put my NDP hat on or BC Humanists. I'm not entirely. I got too many hats going on here. Yeah, I see that. You get, you get like you don't want hat conflicts. hair or something. Well, people need. Grade twelves, especially. I mean, because yes. it'll be fresh in their minds, right? Especially the log- especially the logical fallacy thing and the the political thing as well, because so many people just don't know the difference between the conservatives, the NDP, and the liberals. Yeah. It'd be it'd be interesting to uh, maybe uh, all of us here at Left of the Valley get together, and Kevin, maybe you can help uh, help me as well, and. With Aaron and yourself, Tyler, and, uh, and Nancy, who's not here today, and get together and actually make some kind of a presentation for you to go out there. Although you can't see what's going on, on the screen behind you, and the, the, the visual is, is going to help the students uh, maybe amplify your speech, you know, with, oh, yeah. with charts and, you know, what's actually going on in the world. Tyler knows that he's got Instead of just being a, a voice on a microphone, you know, you actually have a visual as well. Yeah, I'm going to try to talk to my daughter's school because they talked to her about, like, science and animals, and she was studying rhinos the other day. Yeah, but your daughter's very young, though. Well, no. She's but, the grade 12. But I've, but I've taught her, you know, where animals come from. They never even bothered to teach her. It's like teaching biology without evolution doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, it's, uh, if you go back to uh, the, the interview we did with Lawrence Krauss, and this is a while back, um, and we should really bring him back, by the way. Lawrence Krauss says that, you know, we have a tendency to start teaching biology to kids because it's, you know, frogs and it's palpable and you can touch them and see them. But he actually thinks that we should do it the other way around. He said we should start teaching them physics and then go into the other sciences, you know, chemistry and biology after that, and not do it the other way around. I don't agree with that because when you're going all the way back to the beginning with like the big bang and it all started with a big bang 
cosmology and stuff. Well, it's, he, it's hard for them to visualize. No, as no, no. We're not to talking animals. that kind of. We're talking like simple physics. You know, the the the, the fulcrum. You know, the uh, the force and well, my acceleration. Did. Yeah, we we learned all about like fulcrums and and pulley systems and like. Yeah, but we learned about biology machines. before we usually learn about physics. He's he's saying we should learn it the other way around because physics will inform chemistry, chemistry will inform biology, and that is that yeah. the actual order exactly. Like, that, that, I think it was a good point. Although I'm not sure how you would keep the attention of a very young child when you talk about speed and force and acceleration lots of well, yeah. and stuff. Like we had a demonstration from the police force where they uh, they showed you like, That's like basically like force. kinetic motion and and like <laughs> it was just a simple ramp and it had a dummy in it and you let let the dummy go down on a track and it, you'd show you what would happen to you if you weren't wearing a seatbelt. And then that could transfer yes. like, easily into yes. force, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and for those cash strap schools, they would have to, be, uh, to become very, um, they'd have to put up a very good presentation because if you're just going to teach physics in front of a blackboard, it's going to be, it's not going to sink in. Yeah, it's just kinematics, not. it just doesn't communicate yeah. well to kids. Exactly, well, exactly. Yeah. And kids are more interested in where stuff kind of came from. I've given my daughter the basics of the Big Bang from a tiny amount of energy to mm-hmm. getting bigger to, you know, the building blocks, quarks and hydrogen and stars and where everything came from. She likes that stuff. She gets it. And she can explain it. I don't know if she'd be able to explain Newton's laws of mechanics and motion and all that kind of stuff, but... Yeah, if, if you go to Science World in Vancouver, there's a, a nice exhibit that's a permanent exhibit where the kids actually kind of learn about the forces of physics. For example, the, the lever, right? Yeah. Where, you, where you, have a, you have a weight on one end and you have a rope on the other end. And you know where you slide the rope o- along the lever, it makes it much more difficult for the kid to lift that weight. But for them, they see it, a lot of the kids are just jumping on the rope and saying, oh, look at that. You know, it's, like a, it's like a ride. But yeah. there is an opportunity to actually learn uh, but I think it's missed. So this is the kind of teaching we need to really instill in the kids and not just a formula on the board. It's not going to sink in. Well, it I wouldn't sink in at my like, age. In grade one, we had a pulley block and tackle system from one of the farmers in town, and this little girl, I remember her name was Michelle, pulled the entire class. And that like was a great like demonstration of like how like pulleys and like force can be transferred and exactly. like spread out through those. Exactly. It was awesome. But have fun explaining the four fundamental forces and that sort oh, of no, thing. Oh no, we so. learned that in like grade three, four, like Chilliwax uh well, the, a, the grade, a pretty good really? thing there. Yeah. Learned about the greater nuclear force and stuff like that in grade four? Not the nuclear forces, but we learned a lot about like the basics of kinematics and forces and like gravity. Gravity and, and stuff, yeah. 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 Yeah, most people automatically think if you drop a gigantic heavy ball in a tiny little ball that they fall at different rates. So, I mean, it's kind of counter. Show them that picture from the moon with Neil Armstrong and a hammer and a feather. It was great. Oh, well, yes, yes, yes. Well, well, I'll go in to the vacuum, right? In vacuum. Yeah, in we'll a see vacuum. In the vacuum. I'll try to go to the school next week, and if they shut me down, then that'll create some controversy at least. But it would be nice to be able to talk to kids about where did animals come from? Because exactly. the mayor is a young earth creationist pastor. and Go! Oh! I'm afraid that uh, I'm afraid of the power that Tyler's been given now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, C- CFI is huge. Like Richard Dawkins was saying, that mm-hmm. it's even CFI is a lot bigger than the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Yeah, which I was kind of surprised about. CFI's so. done some great things. I, mean, I, I when I met Bill Nye, it was a CFI event in Tacoma, but it was it was great. Yeah, there's Sam Harris ones, Lawrence Krauss. I actually spoke to Lawrence Krauss the other day. Mm-hmm. Um, he's pretty busy, but he said if he was when he's in Canada, he would come and talk to us, so that's kind of nice. Well, what's the next time he's going to be in Canada? Uh, he's doing a book tour, that's what he said. Oh, really? Yeah, well, he just came out with that greatest story ever told yet book. If he come, Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he'll be doing a, a tour. It'd and be great to see him in Vancouver because we can, uh, at that point, hopefully by then we'll be uh, installed at Joy TV and maybe we can have him on the show at Joy TV. But which, by the way, this comes this week. We're having a meeting with them this week, right? Yeah, oh, you awesome. are. I can't make it. You can't watch. I have children to attend to. Can I go in your stead? Yeah. Sure. Well, it's a, right. No, no, okay. you can't, actually. Why not? It's Thursday at 3 o'clock. Oh. You work at 4. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So oh. He can report back. He's just meeting with Dean and whatnot. So. Exactly. Okay. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, this is usually the segment where we have Nancy doing her uh, This Day in History. But we're going to try something different today. We're going to go with... Quack Watch. This is the segment where we're going to be talking about people that we really should think you should keep an eye on because these spew a lot of bullshit. <laughs> and anyway, 
Tyler, you wanted to talk to some about somebody today in particular, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been waiting on stem cell surgery for being blind for years now. So my mother messaged me the other day and said, Oh, Dr. Oz has this uh, episode about stem cell scams. You should really watch it tonight. And I said, Mom, Dr. Oz is a quack. And she was like, what? Dr. Oz. What? He's a, he's a doctor. I said, yeah, he's a very good heart surgeon. But he's got a TV show where he's promoting a whole bunch of products that have zero science behind them. And he's giving advice for other subjects that has nothing to do with the heart, right? Like green tea helps you lose weight and cancer and all these different things he shouldn't be talking about. So uh, I sent Francis some links. One of them is a group of doctors that got together and wrote a letter to the University of Columbia basically demanding that he be fired for promoting pseudoscience yes. crap. This is from the, Na- the National Post, actually. The yeah. uh, lining says, Dr. Oz should be fired from Columbia for promoting quack treatment. Top physicians uh, say in letter. And this is actually uh, from 2015 already. Well, time flies. Uh, Columbia University has not removed t- TV celebrity Dr. Met- Met- Met? Mehmet. Mehmet? 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 Mehmet Oz. What a name. From his faculty position as a group of top doctors has demanded citing his egregious lack of integrity for promoting what they call quack treatment. Dr. Oz has repeatedly shown disdain for science and for evidence-based science, said a letter that the 10 physicians sent to Columbia Dean earlier this week. They say he's pushing miracle weight loss supplements with no scientific proof that they work. Now, Oz did appear in front of the, I believe it's the Senate in the States, yeah. where he was actually accused of that, and it, actually been, it was a bit of a scandal. <laughs> and uh, he used that line uh, his, in his defense, it says that we use flowery language. Now, isn't that a great way of saying that we're bullshitting you here? Yeah. That's alternative facts, right? <laughs> <laughs> alternative facts. <laughs> yeah, so um, he, he, uh, this guy obviously... I know. I mean, when he does his show, I mean, he dresses up in scrubs and all that. People will actually, you know, take his advice seriously. He's even have he, he even has a column in the province. Oh, I didn't and know that. Are you going to read the excuse he gave? Uh, the oh, excuse yeah. he gave for the uh, for what for for uh, the for his movie? show. It's the second link I sent you. Okay, hold on. So the second link it says yes. The headline is, my show is not a medical show, <laughs> despite having doctor in the title, Dr. Oz after being called a quack. In an interview with NBC News on Thursday, Metmet Oz said this TV series, The Dr. Oz Show, is not a medical show. America's most famous doctor has been under fire lately for recommending the viewers some arguably quack treatment that don't always seem substantiated. Even though Dr. Oz might not think this show is about medicine, some of the show's 3.4 million daily viewers. Wow, 3.4 million. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Oh might be under the impression that it is indeed a medical show. The show has doctor in the title. On air, Oz presents himself as a Columbia University heart surgeon, which he is, yeah. and often dresses in scrubs. He also presents health and wellness advice to his audience. Most of his recommendations focus on diet, health, and fitness, but he covers other health-related topics as well. Now, I'm not saying we're not saying here that everything that he says on his show is uh, wrong. I think it said 40%. Really? Yeah, that they calculated 40% of what he promotes has zero scientific backing whatsoever. Wow. Still, Oz suggests the doctor part of his show name shouldn't be taken literally, he told NBC. It's called the Dr. Oz Show. We very purposely on the logo gave Oz as the middle. (laughs) And the doctor is actually up in the little bar for a reason. I want folks to realize that I'm a doctor and I'm coming f- into their lives to be a supportive of them, but I'm not. It's not a medical show. Oh, well, jeez, man. And yet he's getting medical advice and telling people what to buy and what not to buy. He actually had one show where they had like one of those mediums talk to dead people. Oh no! And that was kind of like my first. Clue. Oh, I was like, wait, what, man? A recent study of 40 episodes the show aired in 2013 found that roughly half the advice doled out on it had little to no solid scientific evidence to back it up. Bam. Well, he's probably getting money from these like, green tea companies that say, if you tell people this helps lose weight, we'll give you this amount of dollars. Like, why is he wearing scrubs? Did he just get out of surgery? Does he not realize <laughs> he has a TV show coming up and he has time to change? <laughs> or he just got beer under the wire. Yeah. If they use words like... He's uh, in between two operations, you know? Like yeah. detoxify, purify, revitalize, energize your body, balance it. It's chemistry or electromagnetic energy. Bring harmony to nature and be with nature. Stimulate, strengthen, blah, blah, blah. All these quack words they use. 
How, how about don't get cancer advice from a heart doctor? And yeah. Don't get heart advice from a cancer doctor. I mean, there's a reason we have experts. And, and you different should, branches. You shouldn't even just be going to one expert. This is why we have peer review, because one cancer doctor can say something, and it's complete BS, so the peer review system weeds them out. So my, my mom does this a lot. She is anti-GMO and all these nature homeopathic crap it just yeah. blows my mind the natural right. fallacy right. well i keep trying to get her to check pubmed because she was taking some supplement that was actually dangerous for you i found and okay. she stopped taking it so um, oh. some of the stuff she tells me about does check out some of it doesn't so i just wish she would learn to check pubmed more often yeah, yeah. and preferably not pubmed where it was published in some weird indian journal or something like that hmm. Interesting. Okay. Trying cool. to teach her about the Journal of Nature and you know all these different sources that are actually reliable. So, but this Quack Watch thing is actually is an actual website. It's called QuackWatch.com. Oh, there we go. Yes, I'm actually on that right now. Yeah, they have sure, a whole. Sure, they're not going to sue us for using that Quack Watch as a segment. Oh no, <laughs> no, of, of course not. I mean, they warn you not to trust your doctor. <laughs> they have a, a lot of really good stuff on there. I've looked through all of it and I haven't found anything that isn't really supported. They cite all of their stuff very, very well. So mm-hmm. I was yeah. quite happy with the website. So I thought we would turn it into a, a segment. Well, that's, that's good. good. Well, hopefully our audience can let us know if you like Quack Watch and, you, Quack Watch and want us to continue with it, let, let us know at leftadvelli at outlook.com. As opposed to this day in history. Well, you know. Speaking of which, have we got any hate mail lately? No, not lately. Woo-hoo! But it's okay because we I'm do just going to start making up emails and then emailing. <laughs> <you somehow. laughs> people don't... People don't hate us too bad. Oh, that's good. We do another brilliant moment brought to you by religion. Oh, we got a couple of good stories. A couple, okay. Yeah, of course. Now, a new display going to the creationist Noah's Ark Museum in Kentucky. You guys remember old friend Ken Ham? Oh, yeah. yeah. Never, heard yeah. <laughs> Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Shows what appears to be gladiator-style fights involving rich? humans, giants, and a dinosaur. That's no joke. Ken Ham, founder of the group that runs the attraction, tweeted images of the new diorama on Thursday, and I'm looking at it it's like, my God, you got to be kidding me! Mm. It's, it looks directly out of a movie of like a Marvel comic book. Wow! It, it looks directly uh, at that, like the Colosseum from Final yeah, Fantasy the, Six. There's like <laughs> there's like this giant guy. He's probably like I don't know eight nine feet tall. He's about to spear this woman, and then out of the other door, there's like a T Rex that's coming out. <laughs> A miniature sized T Rex is not as big as like a full size T Rex. <laughs> the dinosaur is visible in the far right of the first image, which has a giant on the left, apparently about the spare human, which is exactly what I said. Ham, Ken Ham, who believes in a strict literal interpretation of the Bible, claims the planet is roughly 6,000 years old, that humans existed alongside dinosaurs, and that Noah even carried dinosaur with him on the ark during a global flood roughly 4,300 years ago. They would have fit. Yes. <laughs> of course, scientists estimate that dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, or a good six, 64.8 million years before the first Homo sapiens, who evolved roughly 200,000 years ago. There's no scientific evidence for a race of giants. Speaking of Quack Watch, <laughs> <laughs> can, can we get him on the show? Can him? Can Ham? That'd be great. We should try. Oh my God! Are you kidding me? Oh, I wasn't. I, I wasn't super impressed with the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate, so I'd like to do it myself. I think Bill and I was very respectful to Ken. He was. Hams. Well, he had to yeah. be. He was surrounded by creationists with guns. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, uh, well, anyway. What's another, the second one? Another story. This is our old friend Pat Robinson from the 700 Club. No, I saw this. Yeah. He uh, wondered if President Obama and other Democrats may have participated in a grand conspiracy to bring down President Trump's National Security Advisor, Michael Flynn. He's the guy who resigned uh, this week over the communication with Russia's U.S. ambassador. Hmm. While Flynn and other White House officials said that the two did not talk about U.S. sanctions against Russia before Trump's inauguration, such statements conflicted with reports from U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies that routinely monitored the communications of Russian diplomat. Pat Robertson, however, wrongly suggested that U.S. intelligence agencies were specifically monitoring Flynn, not the ambassador, and then warned of a larger plot dun, 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 involving <laughs> Democrats, liberal government officials, and members of the media that he believes could be working to take Flynn down and damage the Trump's administration. Referring to Psalm 2, 2, quote, The king of the earth rise up and the ruler band together against the Lord and against his anointed. Robertson said those challenging Trump are really fighting against God. 
Oh, if you're not for Trump, you must be of the devil. <laughs> well, of course. It, it says somewhere in Corinthians or something that everybody's put in, in their power positions by God, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, anyway, <laughs> I think somehow the Lord's plan is being put in place for America, and these people are not only revolting against Trump, they're revolting against what God's plan is for America, because God has a plan for America, apparently. These other people have been trying to destroy America. These left wingers and so called progressive. Oh, man, you know what doing in his voice. <laughs> These left wingers and so called progressive <laughs> trying to destroy the country that we love and take away the freedoms they love. They want collectivism, they want socialism. What they're looking at is a, a free market and freedom from this terrible, over, overreaching bureaucracy. <laughs> they want to fight as much as they can, but I think the good news is the Bible says. He that sits in the heavens will laugh them to scorn. And I think that Trump, someone on, the, on his side, is that that is a lot more powerful than the media. He's a Republican, right? Who, Trump? No. <laughs> 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 no, I meant Pat Roberts. <laughs> uh, Robert, oh, you know what? No, he's actually a decrepit mummy from the, uh, the early uh, uh, dynasty from Egypt, I think. He was Ross' brother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Je- Jesus was a socialist. So the only arguments I've ever heard against that is where they take the quotes from Jesus and the New Testament and say, oh, that only applied to, you know, giving to charity and that sort of thing. But back in that day, there was no separation between religion and politics. So Jesus' as advice also applies to the government. Yes. So you're supposed to take care of me. You know, if you don't feed me. You don't visit me. You don't take care of me. Well, when did we do that? No. When you didn't. When you didn't take care of my brothers and sisters. So it's very, Tyler, very Tyler, s- you, socialist. You're taking it out of context. <laughs> That's not what Jesus was all about. Jesus was about oil, and Jesus was about you know American supremacy, and the, and, and he was white. The, yeah. Don't you know? Ask yourself, how would Jesus invest? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and they all pitched in their money together into one fund and distributed it. Judas Iscariot was like the finance minister of their little movement back so. then. I think so. It was kind of on the down low. Yeah, but he was investing in fishes and loaves. <laughs> he didn't get much of anything. Well, yeah. communists and socialists use the Bible as their own. So I don't know where Pat Robertson gets off See su- that? supporting fish and, all fish this and bread? Thing. There's more where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> we just need more progressive Christians. We need to support our progressive liberal Christian friends and get them to help us argue against this horrible interpretation. Would, would a progressive Christian still be a Christian? Yeah, like the uh, ge- the geologist that we had on the show. That Christian geologist we had? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. He was, he's, yeah. he's wonderful. I mean, even politically, he's wonderful. He accepts, obviously, evolution, the correct age of the earth, that sort of thing. How and are those compatible, though? I just don't get it. Well, they are to a certain point, I guess. It's, it's, it's like holding two completely diametrically opposed ideas in your head at the same time and saying they're both right. That's no. what mental gymnastics are for. Oh, I, th- yeah. I, th- I think I the, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said it best. You know, says God is a, essentially a, an ever, uh, an ever s- a smaller pocket of ignorance. You know, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, it's true. The more we learn, you know, the the, le- the lesser great. his power becomes. Right, and he he just hides more and more. We'll have to get more of those Christians from that. Celebrating creation by natural selection group on. I actually have some who have written really? stuff for bio logos. Okay. And bio logos is fantastic. Excellent. Perfect. So let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. And today we're going to be talking about what are we talking about? Morality. Morality. Objective versus subjective. So we'll be right back after this. If your skepticism is socially conscious and doesn't take itself too seriously, you might like life, the universe, and everything else. People like Ray Comfort are fond of saying, what use is half a wing, right? Have you ever seen a f***ing penguin? (laughs) Life, the universe, and everything else. Available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else. I don't know, Zoom? Is that still a thing? Hi, I'm the Supreme Irreverend Dr. Randy Tyson from the Legion of Reason Diversion. Join me and my co-hosts, Christine Shelska, Twyla, and Nate Phelps, as we explore issues at the intersection of atheism, humanism, and skepticism. Topics range from alternative medicine to the interference of religion in public policy. We often have special guests to help us understand the topic du jour. Previous guests include biologist Jerry Coyne, ex-Muslim author Ali Rizvi, philosopher Peter Bogosian, and the late physicist Victor Stanger. 
You can watch us on the Legion of Reason YouTube channel or subscribe to the audio version through your favorite podcatcher such as iTunes or Stitcher. And don't forget to like the Legion of Reason Facebook page. Do you know where Saskatchewan is? Probably not. It's in Canada. If you do, you might know a city named Regina. In Regina, there's a studio. And in that studio, there are, at least once a month, a bunch of skeptical atheist geeks and goofballs who get together to do a podcast. We are the Brainstorm Crew, and we're trying to help spread a bit of reason and critical thinking while still having fun. Never taking things too seriously, but still not accepting everything we're told, we go through different topics, exploring them in depth, and often disagreeing. We try to stick to provable facts, and we never trust a myth. That's why we say we're woo-free since 2013. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker under Brainstorm. Or check out our website, brainstormblog.net. I can't promise you'll always agree with us, but I can promise you'll have fun listening to us. And we're back. Now, I know we just did the uh, another brilliant moment, but you wanted to talk about uh, a story that uh, we didn't talk about, but we might as well get into it. Apparently, uh, from uh, Patheos, the Christian florist who refused to provide flowers for a gay wedding loses badly in court. Hmm. So this is uh, years after Washington florist a Baronel Sutman, owners of uh, Arlene's Flowers. Arlene's Flowers. That sounds like, I don't know, I'm not sure I want to shop there. <laughs> refused to do business with a gay couple wanting to get married because of her Christian beliefs. The state Supreme Court, court has unanimously ruled against her. The, um, let's see. The Washington Supreme Court unanimously Thursday uh, ruled unanimously Thursday that a florist who refused to provide service for a same-sex wedding broke the state's anti-discrimination law, even though she claimed doing so would violate her religious belief. See, this is why I always say eventually there's going to be rights that are going to supersede others. There's going to be a, a, a scale of rights. It's, it's going to have to happen. Well, it's a public service, right? So they had this well, it was a year or two with, uh, I think it was a cake, like a bakery or something like that. Refused yes. to make the wedding cake for the gay couple. So if you're open to the public, you need to respect the public in general. Yeah, but well, we could throw, God, we could have a whole debate about this. Well, yeah, but I'm an atheist. And if somebody brought me some I love Jesus cake, I'd just make it. Like, get over it. Yeah, fair enough. But l- l- let's put a wrench here, okay? L- let's say, for example, that Left of the Valley got really, really super popular and stuff like that. And somebody like um, like um, Peter Popoff comes here and says, you know, Kev, we-, we like your voice. We like your crew. We want you guys to do a commercial for us. Would we have the right to refuse that? To well, do a commercial for them? I for mean, Peter Popoff. I don't know Peter who Peter Popoff, I don't know who Peter Popoff he's is. A, he's a televangelist. He's like Benny Hinn. He's like uh, he's all these, these wackos, you know. The power of Christ compels you and that shit. The power of Christ compels you! Well, it's not a public service, though, where anybody can just walk in and get you to do whatever commercial I would Well, no, but he's, 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 he's establishing a customer relationship, right? He wants to pay us to do a commercial for him. But we're not obliged to do that. We well, then, if the, we're not obliged to do it, why are these people obliged to serve the Christians? Because they're just supposed to serve anybody. Mm. Like with the commercial thing, your commercials are supposed to be somewhat in line with what you're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Christians aren't going to let us run atheist commercials on their shows, like in between Joel Olstein. So, like, okay, let's say, for example, that still do it, a convicted though. felon, a pedophile, walks into whatever kind of store and they refuse him service. Is it... Is that right? Even if he served his time and his debt to society is considered paid in full, do people have the right to refuse service to somebody that they don't want? And I think most restaurants or whatever, like businesses, have the right <laughs> to refuse service to anybody that like they want. Like NAMBLA, the North American Man Boy Love Association from. What the? What the hell did you get that? That's from South Park. Oh my god! They've killed Kenny! You bastards! Okay. <laughs> but, like, like, just saying, I mean, like, okay, so if a Christian doesn't agree with um, with somebody who's homosexual or whatever and refuses to do flowers, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the same thing. Well, being homosexual is not illegal. Molesting children is. Well, yeah, the, and they're not, equivo- point they're not equivocal. Like, no, no, pedophile is not necessarily yeah. a child molester, obviously. So. Okay, so let me, get, let me continue the article here. So, uh, Stutzman argued that she was ex- exercising her First Amendment right, but the court held that her floral arrangement do not constitute protected free speech, and that providing flowers to a same-sex wedding would not serve as an endorsement of same-sex marriage. Maybe there's the difference. Because hmm. it, it endorsing it, endorsing it. So if we're do if if we for example were to do a commercial 
uh, for somebody like Benny Hinn or Peter Popov or something like that, does that mean we're endorsing him? Probably. Yeah. yeah, like, I mean, well, a celebrity endorsing whatever product does not necessarily mean that they endorse that product. They're just being paid mm-hmm. to do it, right? No, I understand that people are complaining that the government is, like, forcing them to do business a certain way. But honestly, as a society, we need to kind of put negative consequences on being a bigot, you know, being prejudiced, yeah. that yeah. sort of thing. Cause but then where is free speech? Yeah. And where is freedom of expression? And where is, like, freedom of choice? As Sutzman acknowledged at their position, providing flowers for a wedding between Muslims would not necessarily con- constitute an endorsement of Islam, nor would mm-hmm. providing flowers for an atheist couple endorse, a- endorse atheism, the opinion said. Well, and that's not free speech at all, because she's not saying anything. It's just a matter of sending flowers, right? So we do have hate speech laws, which is kind of a yeah. big deal now. This is this is what bothers me about this because we all know that the real reason is because she's a bigot. We all know, mm. uh, but we can't really say it out loud. In a way, so we we have to find a the legal parlay to actually make it you know uh, correct or incorrect. Well, it needs to be illegal to be a bigot to discriminate like the yeah. Whole... But you can't you can't you can't accuse somebody of just being a bigot like that, right? Okay, that's why they use religious freedom. You pull into a gas station, they pump gas into your car. Now, does that mean that you're endorsing whatever the driver believes? No, they don't ask you about your beliefs. You go and supply flowers. Does that mean that you're endorsing what they believe? No, it shouldn't matter. Really? Yeah. And as an atheist, I would, if I had a business like that, I'd serve anybody. I don't care. Even the KKK, I don't care. Just because I don't support it doesn't mean I'm going to discriminate against it, even though I think it's total bigotry and should be illegal. You know, I know some KKK members must have a telephone, so that means that, like, BC Tell is, like, now, like, lending... Well, hold on. You're you're, you're reversing the relationship here. It's not the same thing, right? I mean, if uh, there's a difference between if if somebody's pumping gas in your car or if you're spending your money at that certain gas station, right? You Mm. vote because you vote with your money. Yeah. So if you're saying the KKK is using a BC Tal product, they're voting with their money, but that doesn't mean that BC Tal is endorsing that. No, that's what I was kind of getting at. Like, it doesn't mean that BC Tal endorses the KKK because they supply phone service to them. Yeah, same thing with this flower person. But you can see that the KKK is endorsing BC Tal by using that. Mm. Or they're just up against the wall because everyone needs to have a telephone. Yeah, so, so if the KKK went to Tyler's Bakery, then the KKK supports and endorses Tyler's Bakery. But Tyler doesn't necessarily support what the KKK does. Well, well yeah, maybe they I, just support food. And I would make their pro KKK cake. I don't care. Yeah, with white fondant, right? Mm, that we would just be a need, different question. We need to get rid of bigotry in general. We have the Human Rights Declaration uh, of Human Rights, like I said, which forbids discrimination based on sexual orientation and religion and that sort of thing. So Yeah, you going into Dairy Queen, congratulations, Grand Cyclops. Like, who's going to print that out on a Dairy Queen cake? <laughs> <laughs> Grand Cyclops? Well, whatever they're called, I don't know. It's like a KKK <laughs> thing, isn't it? Oh, Maybe geez. it's like, oh, brother, we're out though. I don't know. We should go get, see if we can get some cakes made at different places and see who turns us down for, like, horrible atheists. Yeah. Stuff that would be on an it. interesting experiment. See what happens. Plus, I like cake. There's a little note at the end of the articles here that says, while the case may be over, barring the U.S. Supreme Court doing something drastic, keep in mind that Donald Trump is considering an executive order that would allow religious people to discriminate without penalty. It is similar to the law Governor Mike Pence signed in Indiana before a public outcry forced him to pull it back. While Trump reported uh, delayed signing such an uh, an order a few weeks ago. With this decision, he may be pressured into giving the thumbs up to a faith-based bigotry. What does that mean, though? Like, what are they allowed to discriminate against? Other religions? In, in, in the, they would be allowed to... Uh, to if he signs that law, yeah. then that, that p- particular uh, flower person uh, with her shop would have the right to discriminate. Oh, okay. Well, because I know they ranked uh, secular humanism as a religion, so they would be protected. Obama put that in, and the Founding Fathers wanted freedom from religion in general for all of them, so that's just not constitutional. It's going to be shut down by all the judges, just like his travel ban was shut down. Yeah, fair, fair enough. But it's also, not constitutional. Well, it dep- if it winds up in the Supreme Court, it also depends who's going to be on the Supreme Court, right? This is why the election was so important, why who was uh, picking the next justice on the Supreme Court was important. It's so funny. They've got the most left-wing progressive head of state in Germany and the craziest discriminating person in the United States. It's like the 1940s in reverse. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> oh, goodness. Anyway, where were we? 
we were going... Oh, yes, today we're doing a, a little debate. I had to bring out that little music. <laughs> it's not a pop quiz, though. It's a little debate between Kevin and Tyler. And, and you. Well, I'm going to put myself in the middle and just toss some wrenches into both your camps. You just save a lot of time. Be, and be just, the monkey for my wrench. You just save a lot of time and declare me the winner. Like <laughs> hell. Give me your 20 bucks first. <laughs> pay him. Pay off the judge. <laughs> so today we're talking about morality. So I guess, how do you guys want to do this? You just want to open up and, uh, or you want to propose a question and then just rebut? Well, we should probably explain the difference between moral rationalism and moral relativism. So, okay, uh, well, I agree. Go ahead and explain that. I agree with Sam Harris that you can actually calculate what is moral using science and math and that sort of thing, where most people, especially most atheists that I know, believe that morals are specific to that culture. So if it's right and wrong in that culture, then there's no objective standard to say that that culture is wrong. That's basically the difference between them. Okay, okay. And I think you can do the actual math, and I'll show a little bit of that after. But I guess uh, we'll let Sawatsky put his case forward for moral relativism, I guess. Yeah. So you support moral moral relativism? I would say, I guess, if for lack of a better term, I think that uh, Tyler is sort of like not really paying much attention to the fact that culture informs what is moral for your culture. Whether you understand it or whether you're aware of it or not, we are taught what is right and wrong by the people who were also taught what is right and wrong all through their lineage and everything. The reason that we function as a culture is because it's sort of an agreed on thing. Now there is elements, as Tyler would probably point out, of like kind of an evolutionary um, feeding of it. Basically, if somebody attacks members of their own tribe, they're not going to do very well within that tribe. More than likely, those people will gang up on them. So therefore, that kind of moral could arise from that. Don't kill people in your own tribe. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And this, this, of course, on the aspect that we're a social species. Mm-hmm. If we were an independent species, let's say, for example, we live a life like tigers, we were all solitary, then that moral would be radically different. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah so there's this battle between... Uh, cultural evolution and evolutionary psychology the people who don't like evolutionary psychology say you know it comes from culture not from evolution but what they forget is that where did that culture come from it came from evolution this is why we have rats and chimpanzees and all these other animals that have very similar morals especially when it comes to cooperation and stuff like people always ask me for absolute morals like an example one of them is Nobody wants to be raped, okay? So if you take wild female chimpanzees and you put them in captivity, what ends up happening is that the women or the females are close to each other, so they team up and they fight off rapists. And some of the... Rapist chimps? Yes, Mm -hmm. and some of the males will actually help them as well because the negative consequence to that is obviously that they don't get to engage in mate selection, right? And uh, the whole paternity, uncertainty thing, that kind of thing. So I think you can do the math for pretty much any different type of moral, whether it be murder or theft or rape or whatever it is, and then apply it to the entire species as opposed to just two competing groups and look at it from the point of the prisoner's dilemma, who's cooperating, who's defecting. Well, yeah. there's only so far that can go, though. Okay. Like our, Give me an example. Well, okay. Within a, within our culture in the West, we uh, we have agreed to like live the way that we do, cooperate the way that we do in our individualistic society, but it stops pretty much as it is right now beyond the West. Like the West is the wall compared to the East. Now the East has their own morals, and typically, like if you're at war with one another, your morals are trying to supersede and trump the other person's morals. So it's not universal across cultures. It, it, its frame of reference is within your own culture. Let me, let me, let me throw a wrench in there. Um, what if, for example, uh, because like you say, uh, if morals are informed by evolution, Tyler says that. What if, for example, we, had, uh, we live in a society right now, we're very well, uh, we're, we're, we're friends and all that. Um, I don't know, nuclear winter tomorrow, something like that. All of a sudden, the populations are decimated. I think I think um, social order will get out, will go out the window, and with it, maybe the same morals that we enjoy. Although it's the same species, but we would become much more uh, 
barbaric in that sense, right. you know, like in the old days, right? Protect your young. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you care about to. the family and the neighbors be damn, right? Yeah. Well, and the thing is that the prisoner's dilemma promotes cooperation and the golden rule. A lot of people think that evolution promotes the whole social Darwinism thing, um, which d d if you actually do the computer experiments with like the tit for tat and the defectors and stuff, the, the defectors win kind of the battles, but they always lose the war. The defectors, you get them together, they wipe each other out. You get the cooperators together and they flourish and they also kind of tit for tat back on the defectors. So over time, the cooperators become the majority, which is why psychopaths are such a tiny percentage. But Kevin was saying, you know, these two different cultures, okay, that's, that's fine. If you want to compare Canada to Muslim countries or whatever, but if you apply the calculation to the entire human species, which is kind of the point, we're trying to keep our species alive, then we need to cooperate with those people, and these Muslim countries are just not cooperating, well, not cooperating with their people at all, with genital mutilation and oppressing women, and it's the golden rule. You got to put yourself in their shoes. Most people aren't trying to go for the preservation of the entire human race, though. Everyone has their ideals and morals that they would like to see dominate other people's morals. True, but people don't want the human species to go extinct, right? No. Well, would you choose a collectivist or individualistic society, for example? There's a point right there that's a, a strife point. Well, it's the many hands make light work kind of thing, right? Well, yeah. Um, like, say, Jap Japan is very collectivist. Everyone's out for the collective group, whereas individualism in North America is more, like, favored and, like, promoted. Mm. Well, I, I maintain that evolutionary game theory supports being a social democrat you know helping everybody because you might be rich but helping the poor social safety nets that sort of thing it decreases violence which also affects you it decreases crime which affects you well how does that explain capitalism then what do you mean well capitalism is definitely not something that's out for the good of everybody yeah it's cap capitalism the the would the one be one that's got the money capitalism would be in the category of defectors which is why when you look at the statistics in the united states it's absolutely terrible compared to the social democrat countries out there and let's face it we also don't have un unfeathered capitalism the way it's you know as per definition yeah it's not let's say fair capital yeah exactly exactly we don't have that same exact model of capitalism there but that's how we kind of came up with free health care here in canada is the yeah, you know the rich people didn't want to pay their taxes for it but we were just sick and tired of people having their babies die because they were denied at the hospital or whatever it was so we decided to all pitch in together and that way if you're rich today and broke tomorrow then you would still have that as kind of a safety net. Absolutely. And our healthcare statistics are so much better than the United States, even though they spend a lot more money per person on healthcare, and their stats suck. Yeah. I Actually, my boss went down to the States. I know this is an anecdote, but he uh, slipped and fell in JFK Airport, and the first thing that they reached for when the paramedics got there was his wallet to see if he had a credit card or a medical card to cover that's, yeah, that's his uh, we're, we're, medical We're going expenses. off topic here. But, hey, yeah. what, if, what if, for example, we, we talk about uh, the collective human, human race, but what if we realize over a certain t amount of time we'd have a subspecies of humans? Because let's face it, we're one species, but it could very well happen. Well, but you uh, won't you won't notice it. Like no, what are you okay. referring to as a subspecies of human? Well, uh, let's say, for example, you had a, a specific group that develops over time um, an ability to be better hunters because they, they could see in the dark better than the average human, okay. right? Would their morality really encompass the regular Homo sapien? I think so, because every species is the same as its offspring. I mean, we have people who are immune to AIDS in Africa. They're not a different species, though. But no. they're immune to AIDS simply because they've been around it for so long. If we wanted to do that, then there would be an infinite species. Uh, every person would be a species unto themselves. Yeah. So let's figure out why things are bad. Why is theft bad? Why is rape bad? Why is murder bad? Right? Obviously, because it disrupts the cooperation between the group. If we're all cooperating for food and society and, and helping each other, then we do great. But once you have somebody who's going around randomly murdering people or raping or stealing resources, it disrupts it. So our ancient ancestors... Like, not 
sure which ones you would call them, whether it be homo habilis or it probably goes back further than that since we see the same kind of behavior even in monkeys. Okay, well, we're looking at like from the outside looking in or whatever. Like from our perspective, we see that murder and rape and pillaging and all that stuff is bad. But the people on the other side who are murdering and pillaging and raping have a different idea of what's moral. They're expressing power and the and the rest of society is just oppressing their power. Yeah, you're assuming also that their economy is based on the same economy that we have, right? Well, the the the, the, the pirate, for example, doesn't have. He's not doing it because he's getting a thrill out of piracy. He's doing it because he's trying to survive too, and he doesn't have the uh, the the support that we enjoy here. Well, that's the exist. That's like saying the prisoner's dilemma doesn't make sense because defectors exist. Well, yeah, yeah defectors exist. Of course, those are the defectors, and they're clearly wrong. Because do you guys know what a Nash equilibrium is? Yes. No. Francis? Okay. So <laughs> you you take two different groups of people who have two different goals, and they kind of meet in the middle, so they both kind of get what they want. Yeah. So that's what we need to do with the wealthiest people and the poorest people is create a Nash equilibrium where they're both kind of getting what they want. Rich people can become poor, poor people can become rich, that sort of thing. But that's sort of prevented by the oligarchy that we're all under. Well, that, that's what we've done with health care, right? Like it was our prime minister whose yeah. mom was really sick, I think, and he supported the health care, and that's kind of how we got it is because, yeah, you might be rich now, but what if you're, yeah. if you're bankrupt tomorrow and you're all of a sudden poor and you need to go to the hospital... You're safe. It helps everybody. It helps the rich. It helps the poor. Nobody has to pay out of pocket. Same thing would be with free university. It's also what's pretty much at the base of our economic system, right? I mean, uh, and before the uh, economics were what it is today, uh, if you wanted uh, to acquire something, you actually had to go fight and go to war for it, which you, you could have a, a, a loss, a big loss, to acquire the specific things. So it became much of a... Uh, uh, a gain, a sum gain, if you wish, to trade with this person instead of actually risking going to war. Not losing your your people. Exactly, you could actually have a plus plus. You know, they they you win, they win, right? That's game theory, right there. Yeah. So do you know what, you know what zero sum games and non zero sum games are, Francis? Well, briefly, yes. Well, just one has to lose, and the other one, you guys can both kind of win. So yeah, that exactly. that's what we need to create. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar. Cooperation. Do you guys ever see a Beautiful Mind with the, the John that. Nash movie? Yep. I never saw that. There's this really good clip. Maybe you can actually insert it into the show after we're done recording. It's called uh, John Nash versus Adam Smith, and they're kind of sitting at like a, a bar with a bunch of beautiful women. Oh, around. yeah. I can I can briefly explain it. Basically, oh, there's a beautiful... I was just going to. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sorry. John but Nash versus... Adam Smith. Adam Smith. But, uh, so yeah, in, instead of each one of the guys competing against each other for the hottest girl in the bar, uh, you know, one guy gets shut down, they all get shut down by this hottest girl. Instead, they decide to go for not as hot, you know, so they have better chances at, because none of the women want to be second choice, right? Yeah. So how about we don't compete for the hottest girl and we all go home and get laid? So that's kind of how he came up with the game theory thing. Adam Smith was everybody does what's best for themselves, and then the invisible hand of capitalism and competition will sort it out. But John Nash said you need to do what's best for the group, and he's absolutely right, and the math supports that. He came up with Nash equilibrium like, what, 50 years ago? Was yeah, I think around so. There? You'd have to... It took him. It took the human race the that clip, long Kevin? to, ar- no, no, to no, arrive no. at that point, though. It's you can not something. Pause it and insert it if you want. The Nash equilibrium wasn't something that was necessarily like a part of game theory t- to start with. Like we didn't have that until Nash came up with it. Yeah. So if it was a natural or a moral absolute, it would have been there the entire time. Oh, but it is. It is within animals and stuff, like the animals that cooperate. I mean, this is. Have you guys heard of the rat chocolate chip test? No. They have a complete stranger rat in a cage, and then they have chocolate chips set out, like five of them, and then they send a stranger rat in, and the rat will go and release the other rat and share its food with them hmm. because it's good for the species. Like, he's not, he's not a member of the group. This is a stranger rat. Uh, bonobos will do the same thing. If you give them food and an op- opportunity to open a door so they can share food with a fellow bonobo who is not a member of the tribe. It has to be a stranger. It doesn't work. They still, they their brains prefer to share food with people. 
So they prefer to be cooperative and basically socialist. So I can take any moral that you guys think would be different in a, in a different culture and explain the math behind why it's still wrong. Like, Why are some cultures uh, not opposed to marrying a nine-year-old? We find it very reprehensible. Yeah. I've, got, I've got the clip here. It's called okay. a, a Beautiful Mind Bar Scene, John Nash Equilibrium Game Theory. How long is it? Two minutes and four seconds. Yeah, yeah, that That's sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. Let's play that. Adam Smith needs revision. What are you talking about? If we all go for the blonde. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get her. So then we go for her friends. But they will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be second choice. What if no one goes for the blood? We don't get in each other's way. And we don't insult the other girls. That's the only way we win. That's the only way we all get laid. <laughs> <laughs> and that pretty much says it, right there. It's kind of the same thing with everybody striving to be rich, you know what I mean? Stepping on everybody to get rich. Instead, we just try to create equal opportunity and work as a group so uh, you were saying about you know marrying nine-year-olds and that was acceptable back in the day it's still in some parts of the world acceptable today too well, the, the, hold on hold on before we get to the nine-year-olds here um there, there, there's a it seemed like cooperation but it didn't seem like cooperation to me see they all went they all went for the uh, the other girls but they they essentially had a truce they all individually wanted to go for the bond they all and if they had a chance, they probably would. Mm-hmm. But they they all they all said, "Look, we we we're cooperating and we're agreeing not to step on each other's toes, but we're all having the same individual goal." In this particular instance, the one that Tyler just illustrated through the John Nash one, there was no real alpha male. If there was an alpha male in that particular situation, he would have got the blonde. What does that say? Maybe he would have. Well, pretty much. He would have beat everyone else up. <laughs> She's mine. <laughs> it, it, mine. It's like a mathematical solution against selfishness. Now, you can apply this to all the different things, especially the golden rule, which is why I support the basic income guarantee so much, is because, like I said, if you end up unemployed for some reason, you've got that social safety net there. Yeah, yeah. Rich people are going to want it. And, and somebody might say, Oh, I make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Why should I be paying taxes for a basic income guarantee? Well, what about your grandchildren? Yeah, and plus, like, think about the crime and everything that's prevented by people having like, you, some kind yeah. of a safety yeah, net. Yeah. But we, it took us years to arrive at this point. It wasn't uh, something that was necessarily ingrained in. And although some some psyche, so some people will say, "Well, you know, some people will take advantage of the system." Yes, so they do it well. Will. Yeah, some people mm-hmm. will. But just like any other business out there, uh, when you uh, let's say you work at a pair of shoe stores or something like that, they do take into consideration that some of their merchandise will be stolen, and they they put that in their bottom line, and they actually account for it. And, and they can still make a profit. Yeah. So even if the the social uh, the the basic income guarantee, even if there is Joe Blow here and uh, Jill stupid there, mm-hmm. decides to take advantage of the system, overall it'd be it'd be stupid to throw away the idea because a few, to lack the better term, a few bad apples would take advantage of the system. Overall, it'd be a much greater good. Well, it's like saying let's get rid of healthcare because all those fat people out there that are just eating like crap and costing us more money and you know. People, smokers, that sort of thing. Yeah. But we still give them free health care, mm. even though they smoke and they eat like crap and they do drugs and that sort of thing. Thank you, BC. I appreciate it. Because <laughs> it's a small percentage of the population, but the, uh, the nine-year-old thing was more acceptable back in the day because people just didn't live as long. I mean, if you had a baby when you were 15 years old, by the time your baby was 15 years old, you were kind of maxing out on the average life expectancy oh, for your for average it's cousin. It is happening nowadays, too. It's not just because of a lifespan thing. It can't be explained away by that. No, no, but he, I think he's, he's pointing out that it started because of that. I'm saying why it's it was... It's continuing uh, today because of tradition. I mean... Which is a raw Jesus' mother was like, what, 14? 
I don't know. Well, we never we talked about no it. There's no age in the Bible that says anything about their something yeah. like that. But I mean, Aisha was like nine or something like that when they yeah. consummated the marriage. Yeah, she married. She married at the age of six. And Muhammad's wife was uh, was six, and then she they consummated the marriage at nine. Yeah, that's right? Aisha. Yeah, that's yeah. who we're talking that was about. Her, that's Aisha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but now we know the science behind it is that their brain development level they can't consent. Their brain development between a nine year old and a 18 year old is massively different if you actually look at the pictures of it it's crazy different well what about if the uh, older gentleman had the iq of say a nine-year-old would that be different well we have laws Ooh. against mentally challenged people being able to be in relationships otherwise anyway so it makes sense like everything comes from evolution all of psychology comes from evolution all of our political ideas come from evolution they can't come from culture because the culture comes from evolution like well then i think the environment would actually play a little bit more of a role in that if if our if our culture or our human race developed on slightly different like circumstances like lower gravity or a planet where it was just always wet and raining and we lived underwater we would have different social constructs and like rules and everything that would come along with the environment well, that's that also, if we were a uh, social species as well, right? Well, that's why we use the golden rule. Do you want to be nine and forced to marry a 40-year-old? No. Do no. you want to be a woman who's forced to get uh, female circumcision? No. Plus, so there's, there's no survival benefit to it, and it's not equal. So it injury violates... to yourself is like preventing the injury or a slight to yourself. But, like, for years, we've been oppressing women. Like yeah. They were yeah. substandard to men. They weren't allowed to vote, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, which violates the golden rule. So why did it last so long then? Well, b because the defectors do that. I mean, they win the battles but lose the war, and they're losing now. I mean, we've had all this revolution stuff with transgenders and homosexuals and females being able to vote and racism and all that kind of stuff. It's like the better angels of our nature. Shit was pretty bad two thousand years ago when he started. That's you know, an excellent book, by the way. Highly, highly recommend that. Yeah, and things are getting better because I think we're learning over time what actually works. The problem is we don't have any game theorists advising this type of uh, political policy. Well, they I should. I think the the biggest problem I have with like the whole argument where we differed on points was uh, the idea of the absolute morality, and that sort of. Because of my definition of what absolute morality is, it means it has some kind of higher authority that enforces it, which is what religion has been doing over the time. Oh yeah, I don't mean years, I right? don't mean enforced. I mean what is right a hundred percent of the time, regardless of a, nothing, of the culture. Nothing is right one hundred percent of the time. Give me the right circumstances, and I'll kill. But killing is not a good thing. Well, no, like I said, with rape, right? With everything, you just you can't justify it. They try. I mean, the Muslims have countries have raped women so they could ex execute them because they weren't allowed to execute virgin virgins. What if you thought your family was the last one on earth and you had one woman who did not want to sleep with all the guys there, but everyone was hell-bent on reproduction for the race and they all raped her? Well, and see, and that would be the golden rule and the benef benefit for the survival of the species is that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, right? So then, therefore, it's not a moral absolute. Oh, it, abs it, it is. In every culture, it would be the answer would be the same. Regardless of what the culture is, if you're facing rape or extinction of the human species, then obviously you have so, to kind oh, of... Oh, no, yeah, and that's at the same time, what he's doing there, if they're raping this woman, uh, just because they're doing it doesn't necessarily make it a moral act. It might be immoral, but it might be immoral, but needed for the survival of the species. Well, yeah. from the majority's point of view, she would be the one that's immoral because she didn't want to reproduce and save the human race. Well, I wouldn't consider her immoral. I mean, you, you'd understand why somebody doesn't want to be raped, right? Well, they, yeah, of course. Of course they not. Sorry, I'm sorry that we have to do this to you, but we do have to do this to you. It kind of sucks. So but. what you're saying is like what the majority want in that is what Trump's, what the minority wanted. I'm not saying I'm not saying necessarily that it's always the majority. I'm saying yeah, yeah the majority, no. but I'm just saying that morals are more fluid than you were admitting earlier. I think you can apply the math to any single situation and come up with the correct answer as to what's beneficial for the group, whether that be the whole world of human species. I don't think it matters what the culture is. That's you can't perceived, say perceived benefit only because like uh, there's a bunch of Christians down everywhere in the world that think that Muslims are a threat. So you get enough people on board with that. 
And well, and, and, they're, and they're wrong because they need cooperation. Well, we know they're wrong, absolutely. Well, only because they need cooperation, whether it be Christians or Muslims. Religions in general kind of divide us all. So, so there you're saying it, that the moral arises from the cooperation and the like, consensu consensus amongst the people. It's not an absolute. It, it, if it's all, if the answer is always the same regardless of the culture because of the evolutionary game theory math, then I would call it an absolute. Let, let me throw a wrench here. Let's go back to that uh, that, that poor the poor girl that's getting raped. Um, let's say, for example, her her captors or her rapists are either religious or not. Yeah. Now, would they say, for example, if you have a group of very religious people, would they actually say, no, we'd rather have the species go extinct? Because it's not the moral thing to do, as opposed to another group that would say, no, the survival of the species is, uh, is uh, the prime factor here. I think sexual drive would trump it, and somebody would find their way to have sex with her. That would be it. Like, that's just the way that sex drive would work. Okay. It doesn't even have to be about reproducing or saving the species. So you've read The Moral Landscape then, right, Swatsky? Yeah. So the basic premise is that you could have a world that is full of maximum pain and suffering, and then you can have another world that is the exact opposite. So maximum well-being, everybody's happy, that kind of thing. I mean, your worst your worst day is you get like I a I just cough. tried to get Sam Harris on the phone. He's not answering. <laughs> <laughs> but th that's kind of the basis that he's starting from, is that we need to move towards the maximum well-being. And he actually gave somebody like $2,000, I think it was, some philosophy teacher, for criticizing the moral landscape because the uh, the basis, the foundation for the argument was an axiom. It was an assumption that we should be moving towards uh, better well-being. It's like somebody saying, oh, who are you to say what is healthy? Maybe I like puking my guts out and having diarrhea and dying. Better well-being for who? It's decided by whoever's in the power, power position over somebody else, and there's always going to be somebody left behind who true, doesn't get to true, write history. True, but, but health is objective. I mean, you can't have cancerous tumors all throughout your body and claim you're healthier than somebody who doesn't. What if you did pull? Dang, Skippy! Where are my manners? Introductions! <laughs> Call me Deadpool. It rhymes with no school. Too cool, ain't no fool, and I'm the best that there is at what I do. Cool. Moving on! Yeah, well, yeah. So yeah. You, you can claim, oh, well, it's my belief that cancer Bell is healthy. Cancer. It doesn't matter if you claim that you think cancer is healthy. It's not. It's the same thing with uh, female circumcision. What's the benefit? What is the pragmatic benefit to it? And it obviously hurts them and... Oh, this is more of a decreases the quality power thing in itself. Like that's to show. Well, they, they also claim that it's supposed to diminish your libido. Yeah, which is you know I, it's I think control. Uh, personally, I think that's flawed. I really well, don't think that it has an effect. But it, yeah, because they don't want adultery, right? It's yeah. brutal and it's barbaric. But it which never happened. It violates the golden rule. So anything I think that violates the golden rule on like a global scale is bad. It's, it's like, did you guys see uh, Nice Guys Finish First by Richard Dawkins? No, I, I think they pulled it off of YouTube, but he has this uh, example with pigeons, you know, picking off parasites or whatever, and he has the, the one type of bird that's the defector, and they go around and they get one bird to groom them, but instead of grooming back, like reciprocating, mm -hmm. they just fuck off, right? Mm -hmm. And then these birds kind of realize who the defectors are, and then they won't help them anymore, and they end up dying of parasites. So the birds that cooperate by, I'll pick out your parasites, you pick out my parasites, that increases their survival rate or chances of survival because they're cooperating together instead of just going around and getting as many birds to pick off your parasites and not spending the energy to help them back. Well, I have a question for you then, Tyler. Okay. What is one moral that is global and universal that applies to everybody in the human race? Well, I said that regarding rape. Okay. Nobody wants to be raped. Absolutely nobody. Even if you simulate rape with your girlfriend, it's not rape. It's fake. It's role-playing. But things against people's will in general like that kind of thing that has an evolutionary benefit. Like I said, with paternity uncertainty and mate selection, sexual selection is a big deal. Women have to be able to have control over that kind of biology just like other primates do but what if that was a culture thing like what if uh it was typically accepted say on the downtown east side that you were going to have sex with a whole bunch of different men and you didn't see it as a bad thing 
Well, it's I not have, universal. Though. I've got no issue with prostitution at well, all. This is hypothetical. I'm just playing devil's advocate oh, no. for Pro- the record. But prostitution <laughs> is prostitution is totally fine. I I think it should be legalized, and the women should have as much power as they can over their own bodies and their own business instead of having pimps control them and abuse them. Well, back in the day when, like, uh, the matriarchal societies, like, they celebrated women and their femininity before the patriarchs became, like, dominant and whatnot, and women were 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 celebrated and everyone wanted to have sex with them. There wasn't anything, such a thing as rape. Right. Well, I mean, we have rape with chimpanzees, right? Like I was saying, you put them in captivity, which would be synonymous with uh, the Neolithic revolution, agricultural revolution. They team up together and men actually help them. So it's there's huge differences between chimpanzees in the wild and chimpanzees in captivity. It's It's actually pretty illuminating on how humans think because we're basically in captivity so so let's throw another wrench here in this uh, this whole rape i love thing. these wrenches yes now let's say for example that of course a uh, rape happens a lot because uh physically men are usually on average stronger than women and they can impose themselves physically on them mm-hmm. now let's say for example our species had evolved the other way around like hyenas Amazon females, women. yeah like females were much bigger than the uh, the average male then with this uh, would we have the same kind of morality about rape? If that would even exist. I wonder. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, you think about it good like question. there's a thought experiment. It's yeah, there's a good thought experiment. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't equate prostitution with rape, though. No, 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 of course not. No, 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 uh, that was a I probably that's what you're but, you know, since, since, you, since you're saying morality will, uh, will evolve from evolution, they, they, so... so if, if it's, we a survival, had evolved, it's a survival mechanism. Yes, if we had evolved differently from where we are now, because it's very easy to, to, to maybe make a judgment of where we are now, but if our species had evolved differently, even a, a, a small difference like size of the, the mates... I think it actually did in some parts, where women were just from selective breeding and stuff, the men were smaller, and the men were... Sexual dimorphism. Yeah. But you got, you got to think about what the negative survival consequences are to these kind of things. Theft, murder, the whole Ten Commandments, whatever you want. But really, what's the percentage of rapists that are men? It's the minority. The vast majority of men are not rapists. Yeah, the vast majority of men do not have to be taught to not rape. But it still exists within that lunatic fringe that we'd all like to beat the living snot well and and steven pinker has a book i think it's called the moral instinct where he argues you know against the blank slate which was another book that he wrote saying that we are we inherit the brains of those that were successful in the past so most people tend to inherit brains of the cooperators so a lot of our morals are actually kind of biologically built in which is why you see two-year-olds you know they'll give another baby like a pacifier or something and say oh it's okay you know like they feel bad they want to help them on uh, the other hand i mean there is violence surviving that way too i, I know f- from several like examples that kids don't have to be taught to be violent some kids are just born violent yeah and there's a survival benefit to that as well obviously right but that doesn't explain like how violence is like not amoral well, because it depends on the end. It depends thing. on the end result. I mean, my two-year-old being violent does not put my life in jeopardy, right? So, they can be violent. It's not putting anybody in jeopardy. Not many two-year-olds are killing people, but no. But if a two-year-old with another two-year-old, yeah. So you got to think about go back all the way back to monkeys. You know, twenty million years. It always ago. goes back no, to no, the monkeys. No, no, no. The Cameron Francis. We story. didn't evolve from monkeys. We had a common ancestor that yeah. split off to monkeys and men. Aaron Ra would disagree with you. He says we are still monkeys and technically. Well, we're animals for sure. Yeah. We're still evolving so animals. But so you are still what your ancestor was. Yeah. So monkeys basically apes split off from monkeys and we are apes. That's not the point. The point is if you have a group of monkeys that are all working together to collect food and protect each other. And then you got just one of them that's going around stealing food and hoarding it. It's no longer equal. The group of monkeys is going to punish that one monkey. And that's where you get laws against theft, right? Parasitic kind of, yeah. Same thing with rape, like with the violating mate selection, golden rule. All these different things have actual pragmatic results. The well, reason, that because it comes down to survival. What about parasitic organisms like tapeworms? So it's like... How does that fit in, like, 
they are definitely not. Well, they're concerned with their species. No, they're concerned with their species, but I mean, like, there's really no grand scheme kind of thing that's good about a parasite. Well, they continue. It's the survival of the genes, though, right? So it, it's not moral and it's not immoral. I mean, we have that kind of concept, and as do, you know, chimpanzees and stuff, because they have that emotional part of the brain. Tapeworms don't even have a limbic system or any emotional part way. of the brain whatsoever. So they actually had rhesus monkeys that would starve themselves because every time they had to uh, pull this rope to get food, it would electrocute a different monkey. And the monkeys would starve themselves. They've had monkeys that would go in to rescue another monkey out of the water, yeah. even though they couldn't swim, and they would drown. Okay, but still the bottom line is is that for a moral to be accepted, it has to be agreed upon by everybody within that society and that culture. I, I don't think so. I think it's agreed on after it's beneficial to right, evolution. Once everyone can maybe agree, then the benefits. Maybe not agreeing. Maybe the word is recognized. Recognize or accept. Yeah, well, why is it bad? People never ask that. Why is murder bad? I mean, why do we have first-degree murder, well, second-degree murder? Hug for a while or whatever we, we started out with. Justified Cain homicide. Well, we it's have, consequential ethicism and empathy, right? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm definitely a consequentialist. I think Sam Harris is right. I think his only problem is that he's not using evolutionary game theory as a, a foundation for his argument. And uh, Richard Carrier wrote a pretty long article saying that this is not Sam Harris's idea, and there are a lot better people actually defending it, and he kind of explains the difference between subjective and ob objective morality. Still, it forms within your culture. Now, consider, like, in World War II, there was a lot of German people that lived in America that were then forced to go and fight against their country, against, against their brethren or their, you know, where they came from. Yeah. So, where whose ethics were trumped it's basically whoever won the war essentially but can you imagine being like a german and a canadian and then having to fight against the germans as a canadian where your family is basically and fight against your own family well and the and the german the whole nazi thing obviously that was a defector in the prisoner's dilemma that we had to cooperate against to wipe them out because they would have decreased our survival for our species because they were trying to wipe out not just the jews but the blacks and the disabled and the homosexuals. So Which brings us to like the Stanford experiments where it was determined that everybody had the capacity to act like a Nazi, essentially. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's why they say, like Robert Spolsky and stuff, they say that uh, the defectors win battles a lot. And they do. But they always, always lose the war. Like they had, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Robert Axelrod experiments with the computer programs with the, the strategies, and they pinned them all against each other. Yeah. And tit for tat, which was, you know, you start out cooperating, yep. and you can think about this in terms of politics too, should always start out cooperating, mm -hmm. but always fight back when somebody attacks you, and then you have to also be forgiving as well. So they pinned these computer programs against each other, like social Darwinism programs, and the cooperating programs wiped all the other ones completely out. Over time, they lost battles That's here and there. Interesting experiment, but I mean, okay, how, how quickly did people in Nazi Germany have to abandon their morals and their beliefs and their ethics because they were under that social dictatorship regime, of the Nazis or whatever? Most people were able to inform on their friends and turn Jews in and... Well, hold on. It's, it's, it's not like they went 100%. For example, if you're turning in a Jew, it's not like all of a sudden you're completely not racist and as soon as the Nazi came in, all of a sudden you turn racist. No, there, there was were, an undercurrent of racism there, already. There was the undercurrent of racism, but there was also like the powerless to be able to do anything. Morals went right out the door. Like You could not afford to be moral. Ask Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. you're, you're, yeah, you're scared of the defectors, right? Right. Yeah, but again, everybody kind of pooled together and decided that these this group of Nazis was defecting against the rest of the world, and they got rid of them. Not from the inside, though. Well, no, they tried. There was like, what, 42 attempts to kill Hitler, and a lot of them were Nazis. They blew up a briefcase right beside Hitler, and he survived. Yeah, was that, that was the movie of Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. Valkyrie. Yeah. Uh, Valkyrie, yeah, yeah. I yeah. hate Tom Cruise, so yeah. I... From now on, my fist is going to be so far up your shithole that every time you have a thought, it's going to have to tiptoe past my wedding ring. Rather just watch the documentary, but the Nazis, of course. the Nazis put a bomb in his plane and it froze, and this was from the inside. 
So I if you the inglorious bastards blew him up in a the theater. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's still the prisoner's dilemma, no matter what. You just you have to apply it on a bigger scale because the defectors do win battles, but they lose all the wars. When you're using the when you're using the prisoner's dilemma on two people, yeah, then you're gonna get different answers. But if you use it on an entire population, especially a world population, like. But in the prisoner's dilemma, there's a lot of information that would have to be communicated that wouldn't be able to be done in a real time, real life like scenario, real world. Like nobody's going to come in and tell you, okay, if you press the button or if you rat on your friend, rather, um, we'll let you go and heal. But if he does the same, then you're both in for jail and blah blah blah. Nobody's going to communicate that to you in a Nazi regime. No, of course not. And in the real world example, like the mafia and stuff, they say nobody rats. So that's how they're trying to achieve the prisoner's dilemma because that's the best payout. Because the best payout isn't you win and they lose. Even though in university, if you go to classes and you study the prisoner's dilemma, they tell you that you ratting and them losing is the best payout. But it's only the best payout for you. Not it's not the best payout it's not a cooperative for cooperative thing. Yeah, it's not the best payout for you and that guy and that group that you guys are from. I mean in real life you rat on the guy, he goes to jail, you get out, you get whacked. Pretty much. So yeah. It's not realistic. So I'm saying we can apply this to the world population. Like the example Sam Harris gave, because he was criticizing this woman who said you can't criticize things that are based on religion uh, and he's saying, well, what if it was, you know, customary to remove the eyeballs of every third child or something like that? Would that be right? And she said, well, yeah, because it's their religion and their culture. Mm. And Sam Harris was like, wait, what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, so, chopping off hands for thieves and stuff like but, that. But what he didn't, what he didn't explain was that it, having no eyeballs, as I know better than anybody here, <laughs> <laughs> true that, dec decreases your survival ability. It decreases your chances of defending yourself and protecting people and getting food and getting a job and all these different things. But so, we do value your intelligence, well, for sure. Tr true, but you're not paying me for it yet. The great thing is, too, we don't have to dress up whenever you're here. So, <laughs> I would just like to say, in conclusion, I do not believe that there is any moral absolutes. I believe they're f subject to be fluid, or like to, they're very fluid. They're dependent on culture, evolution, psychology, a lot of different factors, and they're not universal or global. And you, Tyler, your final statement? Final statement is you're, I just explained that I can run the math regardless of culture. <laughs> Show me the math. I, I did with Nash equilibriums and cooperation. But that's all hearsay dilemma. and anecdotal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. That was a great spirited debate. Well, watch. Everybody needs to look up Why Should I Be Nice by Robert Sapolsky. It's a little short thing. It's from the University of Stanford. And he explains all this kind of, I could just go on and on and about evolutionary games. I would like, we don't, we don't I would like for you on. guys to watch Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner and the, the, <laughs> the Coyote. Like, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, maybe our listeners can let us know which side they fall on. You can send us an email on left at out, left at valley at outlook.com. Um, coming up, we'll have next week. You gotta, you gotta. You get somebody coming in, Tyler, don't you? Next I'd week? like to do a free build debate. I'm not sure if he's 100% available, but I also have. What's his name? The guy for the. Yeah. Oh, uh, Bill Tanford. Oh, yeah. like we, we, we get some guy come. We get some guy came. Anyways, I have I have an author. Uh, he's quite famous, actually. Can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he does uh, the JFK conspiracy thing. Okay. He does, oh, I, okay. Yeah. Should yeah. Be fun. He does think okay. that it was a conspiracy. I'm guessing him and I are gonna butt heads on the magic bullet because I think the magic bullet's bullshit. Oh, okay. We also know. we also have Corey Johnson from Brainstorm Podcast coming up. We'll have Mr. Brian Keith Dalton, Mr. DD coming up. Cara yeah. Santa Maria will be coming up. Who's that? Oh. Who's that? Cara Santa Maria is a. Uh, she's also a part of the uh, Skeptics Guide to the Universe. Oh, who's a hot girl? Yeah. Nice. Yep. How do you know she's hot? She's she got is. a nice voice. She is. We need suggestions from uh, viewers as to what kind of shows more of debates. Course. I think more debates would be great. Oh, we else? also have yeah. Jim Newman of the Life Universe and everything else coming up uh, soon as well. Sweet. And we got lots of good stuff. Let's coming get up. some pro lifers. 
We could work on that. You said that we might be able to do a pro life debate like a year I mean, ago, and they never showed up. No, they never showed up. They or, were afraid for I, their lives. That's like that Rami guy. We sent him an invitation. He just says chicken out to. And I have a debate coming up with uh, Chris Christian. That's right, yeah, Chris, Chris, who's yeah. studying a Christian apologetics. We'll talk, we'll talk about the uh, resurrection, Trinity, Trinity Western, Western University, and I'm going to destroy Chris. him. <laughs> Hi, Zach. <laughs> He's a nice guy. Yeah, they're nice guys. They're nice guys. You Absolutely. can follow us on the left of the valley dot com. You can follow us on Facebook on. On Twitter at, at LATV Podcast. If you're following us on iTunes, send us a five star review if you like the show. We'd really appreciate that. Anything else you guys want to add? Yeah, you I, can, we, I look forward to the hate mail, so you can send that too. That too. You can find us at the Left of the Valley Facebook group, my group, which is discussion group for intellectuals, but you'll probably get kicked out if you're even remotely stupid. <laughs> and That's then, why I'm not part of the group. And then <laughs> the, the slightly less picky group is Church of, Church of the Basement Dragon. Yeah, it's a good group too. It's a wonderful group. You don't have to be as smart and you don't get kicked out so fast. All right, Joe. Go. Good Land show. Slide. Cool. Thank you so much, Joe. Until next much. time. That was awesome. Teaching them to respect them. Respect them. Fuck that. The system is broke down. Working backwards in the only action or tactic I plan to practice now is to attack them. The parties of God's hands are blood stained. Millions of murders by believers, and they're all in God's name. And let me take a sec. Don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, unintended, I find it disgraceful that many atheists are told to be quiet. You're not alone. Speak your mind. Time to let it be known. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. 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 I'm an atheist. Atheist. Atheist.